Dear friends, Mark Kali, perhaps one of the most riveting, fascinating, and inspiring symbols to have come out of South Asian spirituality. And even today, when people think about Hinduism, when they think about um, the more non-dual traditions of Hinduism, inadvertently, Mark Kali's image comes up. Sometimes through study, through reading books, through attending pujas and going to meditations and people's houses and going to temples, etc. But sometimes also in meditation itself, there are many people who in the West have sat down to meditate. Some of them have been at Vipassana retreats. Others have just been at home experimenting with meditation. And many of them, having never once heard about Makali or seen Makali or said the name Makali, have had visions of Makali. You know, so there's some objective quality to this natural world, to Prakriti, that seems to express itself in the symbology of Kali, this wild and ecstatic mother reeling under the spell of some, some divine drunkenness, hair disheveled and flowing like time itself, the drift and passage of things, who is nude, dark, terrible, and astoundingly beautiful, who is as pleasing as a fool's moon's orb, who has around her neck a garland of 50 skulls, symbolizing the 50 letters of the Sanskrit alphabet out of which this entire universe is constructed. This mother, wild and wild haired, who tells the name of God on the skulls of the dead, who is garlanded in uh, uh, skulls, but gir girdled in human hands or demon hands. Ah, we could go on all night. Makali is um, so central to the highest philosophical insights of South Asia, the, the finest, deepest most thrilling of philosophical insights is given form, is clothed in, is symbolized by Makali. So today, in honor of the nine forms of Madurga, in honor of Shivaratri, uh, sorry, in honor of Navaratri, though they are one and the same, you know, the fire and its heat are inseparable. So Makali and Mashiva, they come together. But in honor of tonight's, last night was Shivaratri, the night on the 20th day of the moon, Shivaratri. Today is Navaratri, the nine nights of Durga. So in honor of the nine nights of Durga, I thought I would do a few things today by Makali's grace. So if she so wills it, this is what we hope to do. First, I want to tell you a little bit about the philosophies that are clothed in the form Makali. So I want to tell you a little bit about what Makali represents in South Asian spirituality. Also, I'm just now noticing that Hazel is here, Angela is here, and just so many old sisters that I've not seen in some time are here, and I've missed you so much. Angela, come. I've been waiting for you to come. Makali is here. Like, where's Angela? Sometimes people walk into my house and Makali is smiling a little more. Among them is Priti. Priti is a beautiful Kirtanwala. So when she comes into the house, Makali seems to perk up a bit. She's, oh, look. One of my favorite murtis, Priti, has walked in. Another one is Angela. When Angela walks in, Makali, Lord Shiva, I'm very happy. So come, I've missed you all. <laughs> welcome, welcome back, Hazel. Welcome, welcome. Nice to see you. So I think the first thing we'll do today is I'll explain very briefly, in, in very brief terms, what Makali represents philosophically. And today, we're not really going to consider Advaita Vedanta. Surprise, surprise. There's a blue moon today. No, okay, we're not really going to talk about Advaita Vedanta. Instead, we're going to talk a little bit about Sankhya and how Mark Kali and uh, Prakriti are one and the same, and how it is that the non-theistic school of Kapila is given a deeply, devoutly, intoxicatingly theistic interpretation by the Shaivas. Um, and then after that, I'll talk a little bit about Tantra itself as a non-dual tradition. So from Sankhya to Tantra. So we're skipping over Advaita Vedanta. I'm just going to explain how it is that this world is a manifestation of consciousness and why Mark Kali is the best symbol for that. That's the first thing I'm going to do, God willing. The second thing is I'd like to discuss what the motherhood of God means for us, not just as dualists or non-dualists, but as spiritual practitioners. So what is the unique benefit of approaching God as mother? What is the kind of um, strategy here? Why would we regard this terrifying symbol of destruction, who is both benevolent and yet terrifying, is the ultimate symbol for consciousness in action? So after having explained philosophically what Makali means, we'll explain it more practically. Why do we approach Makali in this way? And finally, if there's some time, mother willing, we'll tell some stories. And we'll talk a little bit about the Dasha Mahavidyas, the 10 forms of Kali. We'll talk a little bit about the Navadurgas, the nine forms of Madurga and, and all of that. And what Navaratri means in the context of all that we've just discussed. So that's, that's where we're headed. Before we go anywhere, though, and remember today, uh, like... Usha Harding says so beautifully in his book, in her, in her book, Kali, the Black Goddess of Dakshineshwar. Whenever you visit a Kali temple, it's good to have a guide, especially if it's your first time. So going into a Kali temple, let's take the help of a guide. And I'm going to bring to our attention three particularly, um, what do you call it? 
qualified guides to help us today in our inquiry into this deepest of traditions. And the first is, of course, um, Ram Prasad. Ram Prasad is perhaps one of the most well-known Bengali poets who sang songs to Makali. Uh, he existed probably in the 17th century, and his poems are sung far and wide all over the world, and all of them are, are drenched in devotion to this, to this Makali. So we'll take some poetry from Ram Prasad and consider that po those poems in the light of what we'll discuss in the philosophical part of today's lecture. So we'll take Ram Prasad's help. Second, we'll take Sri Ramakrishna's help. So we're going to look at some things that Sri Ramakrishna said as Mahendranath Gupta or M reports in the Gospel of Sri Ramakrishna. I'll read to you some translations from Swami Nikilananda of Sri Ramakrishna's um, statements, and we'll see what those statements mean for us as devotees, as spiritual aspirants, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And uh, I'll think I think I'll start with Swami Vivekananda. So Swami Vivekananda, as you know, is a devo uh, is a devotee of Makali. He's a non-dualist. Above all, he is an Advaita Vedantin, and his message here in the West, being the first spokesman on behalf of South Asian spirituality in the West, his message was intoxicatingly Advaita. Right, like through and through, his message to most audiences was Advaita Vedanta. You could say, ah, uh, Swami Vivekananda, he is a Shankarite. He's giving us Shankara's Advaita Vedanta. But is he? Because to many audiences, he's also giving another version of Advaita, which tonight we're going to call uh, Shakta Advaita, or rather, I should say, has been called by this tradition Shakta Advaita, the non duality of Ma Shakti, or in other words, Tantric non duality, which has marked differences from the Advaita Vedanta of Shankara, you know. Um, at least in philosophical or theoretical terms. Now, Swami Vivekananda, as a young boy, rejected all religious imagery in the form of like murtis and gods and goddesses. As you, as you recall, uh, in India at this time, there was a movement called the Brahmo Samaj, and they were interested in kind of revamping Indian spirituality by introducing like Western Christian elements, uh, but using Upanishadic languaging. So one thing that they were deadly opposed to was ritual worship of murtis idol worship. That's one thing that the Brahmo Samaj was trying to erase from the Indian subcontinent. They saw this type of puja, this ritualistic worship, this tantra, as a kind of like superstition mongering tradition that was weakening the national spirit. So they felt as if um, Indians participating in like these forms of Hinduism were not practicing correctly, religiously speaking. They were kind of diverted and they were like confused. I mean, you get this kind of thing today even, right? Like anybody who worships idols, many people will say, yeah, it's quite weird. Now, Brahmo Samaj was founded by Indian thinkers. And among them, the brightest of Indian thinkers was Keshab Chandra uh, Sen, who, by the way, dined with the queen. He was quite a, a celebrity, not just in India, but all over the colonies. This is like in the 1890s. So Keshab uh, was a very, very famous Brahmo leader. He was the leader of the Brahmo Samaj. He was an intellectual and he gave speeches. He was above all an orator. And because of his like Western educated uh, background, because of his like eloquence, he attracted mostly the young men of Calcutta at the time. So his audience was, was mainly young Western educated men. And among them were the future Swamis Vivekananda and Swami Brahmananda. So they as young men had gone to the Brahmo Samaj. And just to give you a picture of how deadly opposed they were to idol worship, if you wanted to attend and be a part of the Brahmo Samaj community, you had to sign a written document um, swearing that you will never worship any gods in the, in the forms of like Makali, Shiva, any of these murtis. <laughs> you know, so it's an interesting thing to actually like sign on. By the way, if you go to Varanasi today and you try to go to the Vishwanath temple, they actually give you a document to sign to like swear that you're Hindu because there have been too many tourists flooding the temple. So they want to make sure that the temple is still accessible to those who want to go and worship, not just like take photos and stuff. So <laughs> some form of that still exists, but in reverse, I think. <laughs> Now you have to sign to go worship Shiva and Murti. But back then, these young boys, Western educated boys in 1890s, actually really more like 1860s, uh, 18 like 70s, these late 19th century boys would be signing these things. You know? But they were very inspired by Keshav's message. It was a very clean, philosophically elevated message. So among these boys who were kind of in Keshav's posse was uh, not posse, so to speak, but his community was um, Narendrana, who would later become Swami Vivekananda. So as a very young aspirant, Narendranath was already interested in meditation. As a young boy, he was interested in like murtis and, and worship. But by the time he had reached his maturity as a 19 year old boy, he was done with all of those like idol worship types of religion. He was very, very devout though. And he meditated a lot and he was very interested Anyway, he eventually meets Sri Ramakrishna. And Sri Ramakrishna was the single greatest influence in Swami Vivekananda's life. But as you know, Sri Ramakrishna is first and foremost the devotee of Makali. 
Everything Sri Ramakrishna achieved in spiritual life came through Makali and his Ishta, his personal form of the divine was Makali. And he was always in communion with Makali. So he'd like talk to her in the middle of a room of, full of people. He would see her, you know, and uh, Vivekananda, of course, at first was disturbed by this. He rejected all of these visions as hallucinations. He said, Sri Ramakrishna, this is just a sign of a weak nervous system. Okay, none of these images are real. You're not actually seeing Makali. And Sri Ramakrishna would just smile and, and take it all in stride. And other devotees of Sri Ramakrishna could not believe Narendranath's insolence. They kept saying, why do you let this boy treat you like this? He's such a bully. He comes in here. He steps all over your experiences and your visions. And Sri Ramakrishna says, you wait. It's not a bad thing. It's actually a sign of his strength that he doesn't accept anything without reasoning it out truly and thoroughly. Once he accepts something, it's final and irrevocable. He doesn't give a lukewarm intellectual assent to anything that he hasn't experienced for himself. You see, I think it's a good attitude for us to have. So Swami Vivekananda, championing the age of reason and the scientific acumen of the West, was not ready to accept on faith that which needed to be validated by experience. So at first, he was deathly opposed to Makali. In one place, Swamiji even said he hated the image. He said he was not only disturbed, but he hated the image of Makali. He, he was grossed out by it in some form, some shape. So anyway, that's Swamiji. And one day, as we said a couple of lectures ago, he had fallen on hard times. His father had died suddenly, you know, uh, just out of the blue, his father had died and um, had been in debt. So at this point, the, the rich family that Narendra belonged to was torn asunder and many people in the family had turned against them and were trying to seize land. And so he was involved in court proceedings. It was all a very dark time for Swami Vivekananda. And he became rather atheistic. He couldn't understand the mercy and benevolence of God in a world that was so dark, cruel, and abysmal. You notice all devotees, all bhaktas, all spiritual aspirants must reconcile this first thing, a benevolent God and an obviously degenerate world a world in which the good suffer and the bad seem to prosper at times, right? Like we all have to, as bhaktas, face the fact that if God is benevolent, why does the world look this way? <laughs> you know, so Makali, as I'll explain hopefully later in this lecture by her grace, is the ultimate reconciliation, the ultimate way to deal with this philosophical conundrum, which in the West has been called the problem of evil. Okay, now Swami Vivekananda, because he had fallen on hard times, he was desperate, he was humbled, and he went to Sri Ramakrishna and he said, you know, I see you talking to Divine Mother and I, I see that she grants your prayers and, you know, I, I feel like giving it a try. I'm paraphrasing. I'm making it sound a lot more colloquial than it was. But I think he, he, he asked Sri Ramakrishna to intervene on his behalf. He asked Sri Ramakrishna, who was his guru, to ask Makali for help. And Sri Ramakrishna said, what are you talking about? I'm not, you know, I don't make these demands of Makali. I never ask for money or anything like that. You know what? They're asking me to pray for you. Go pray yourself. And this is a sign of a good priest. You know, Sri Ramakrishna is a priest. He's a good priest because he doesn't want to exploit his relationship to God and say, I am the middleman. I am exclusively able to talk to God. And now you can only talk to God through me. No, as a priest and as any good priest, he's saying, I'm only here to facilitate your relationship with God. And not only was he a priest, but he was the guru of Swami Vivekananda. So beyond just like trying to direct Swami Vivekananda to Kali so that he could see her for himself, he was as you know, a person who was deeply invested in Swamiji's like spiritual development, he was doubly invested in Swamiji going to Makali and asking him her himself. So he goes, you know, it's a Tuesday, by the way, an exceedingly auspicious time for the worship of Makali. So on Tuesday, he goes into the temple, the Dakshineshwar temple, late at night. I think it was like um, late, maybe after nine o'clock, like 11 or midnight or something. It's typically Makali's time. So he goes inside. And interestingly, even before he got to the temple, on his way there, as he was walking to the temple, some mood came over him inexplicably. Remember, he's not a believer. He's not like psychologically primed for this. He's disturbed by Makali. In one place, he says he hates Makali. And yet this person, this seeming critic, is walking to the Kali temple and suddenly, against his will, um, a, a mood comes over him. And it's a divine drunkenness. He reports that he started to sway. He started to sway under the influence of this heady wine. He didn't quite understand it, but it was an inebriation. You know? And now he gets into the temple. And the moment he stepped into the temple, he could already feel the murti as alive, living murti. Now, you'll recall that Sri Ramakrishna was also of a scientific temperament. So when he had his vision of Makali, he wasn't satisfied. He, he, at that point, actually, even he doubted whether his vision was true or not. So he kept saying, you know, if that vision was true, this rock will jump three times. Supposedly it did. 
So anyway, he would always test Makali in this way. And way before, when Sri Ramakrishna was doing his initial sadhana, he had gone to Makali and placed a cotton swab under Makali's nose to see if the image was actually breathing or not. Isn't that interesting? Sri Ramakrishna felt the image to be alive, but if it was alive, it should breathe, right? So to test his hypothesis, he put a cotton swab under the nose of the image and apparently he could feel like the moisture or whatever. So that's supposedly what happened in Sri Ramakrishna. Now, Swamiji, he had no such inclinations, right? He didn't believe the Murti was alive. But this time, on this particular night, he walked into the room and saw in the shrine Makali as a living Murti. There was some presence in the very stone. Now, I know I'm jumping around a little bit in the story, but things are coming to mind and I feel that they ought to be expressed. One time, Swami... Uh, so Sri Ramakrishna was talking to M, who is the recorder of the gospel. And this was M's first real conversation with Sri Ramakrishna. It was actually their second meeting. But this time, M started to inquire and ask questions and really, you know, kind of probe Sri Ramakrishna's knowledge for its depths and, you know, it's fathomless. But he started asking, like, oh, what's, what's up, you know, what's going on in spiritual life? And he asked, why should people worship clay? You know, what is, what is this all about? Like, surely clay is not God. Why should people worship images? Why should they worship clay? And Sri Ramakrishna said, why clay? It's an image of spirit. Very cryptic statement. It's not clay. It's not matter. It's an image of spirit. And hopefully in a bit, I will explain in philosophical terms what that means. Why matter is not matter. It's actually an image or a symbol for spirit. In other words, this whole world that you see around you is a metaphor for Makali, is a symbol for Makali. Makali is not a symbol for the world. The world is a symbol for Makali, as we'll soon see. Anyway, so Swamiji, now he's standing there in the shrine room. He sees that this murti, this physical statue, is no longer a physical piece of stone or what have you. It's actually a living presence. And that mood intensifies. Now, according to the, uh, the account, he actually then saw Makali. He got an image of Makali appear to him in vision. And he was flooded with bliss and joy. He started falling to her feet and praying, oh, Ma, give me Viveka, discernment between the real and unreal. Ma, give me Vairagya, true renunciation. Ma, give me knowledge of Brahman, like all of that. He started asking for spiritual things. Now, he ran back to Sri Ramakrishna to report what had happened. Oh, probably said, Gurudev, Gurudev, I saw Makali. I had an experience from, of Makali. Now, he's obviously very excited. This is a big moment for him in his spiritual life. Sri Ramakrishna is not bothered. He's not surprised. He's not overly excited. This is every day. This is like, Every Tuesday night, like every, every day, Sri Ramakrishna goes into Samadhi like however many times. So he's not impressed. He just says, did you ask her for the money though? Did you do what you went to do? Like, did you ask her to help your family? And Swamiji said, well, I mean, young Narendranath, who would later be Swami Vivekananda, said, well, no, I could not. I, I, I couldn't think of that at the time. And so Sri Ramakrishna says, fool, well, it's not too late. Go back there and ask her for the thing. Go back to the temple. So he goes back to the temple a second time. And a second time he has the vision. A second time he's flooded with divine intoxication. And a second time he forgets to ask for the money. <laughs> so he comes back to Sri Ramakrishna and reports that he had again forgotten to ask for what he wanted. And Sri Ramakrishna said, oh my God, go again. You know, third time. Try it again this time. Can you not keep your mind fixed and still? Can you not control yourself, boy? Go again. So he goes back. And uh, this third time, the same thing happens. Now it's obvious that Sri Ramakrishna, um, this is all part of his pedagogy, of course, and it's obvious that Swami Vivekananda uh, was deeply, deeply changed and moved by that experience. And so he actually asked Sri Ramakrishna for a song to sing to Makali. He was a great singer. Swamiji loved to sing, but typically he would sing Brahmo Samaj songs, songs that represented the Brahmo ideal of spiritual life, which is a kind of Upanishadic, Abrahamic type of um, fusion. But this time he asked for a song to Makali. And it's that song, Amar Ma Tuam Hi, you know, oh, Ma, you are our soul redeemer, like that. You are water, you are earth, like that. So he asked for that song. He learned it. And that night, he went back to the temple and spent the whole night singing that song. Now, the next morning, he was sleeping through the day, right? Because he'd been up all night singing this song to Makali. So he was asleep on Sri Ramakrishna's floor. And the next day, someone had come. I think it was Vaikuntanath or some other devotee had come. And Sri Ramakrishna was just smiling. Say, and he pointed to the sleeping form of, of Swami Vivekananda, young Narin, who would later be Swamiji, pointed to him and said, you see this boy? He's a very good boy. Yesterday, he had a vision of Makali. You know, Swami Vivekananda, this was his first experience. So obviously, Sri Ramakrishna was very pleased. Now, mother worship, Makali, and the role of the motherhood of God was central to Swamiji's teaching. Yeah, look at them. He accepted the mother. Yes, exactly. I think those were really accepted. Now, this was central to Swamiji's teaching, but not to everybody. 
He did not teach this just on mass, like on the stage to the Parliament of World Religions. He didn't teach it to large audiences. Now, when he came to America, and this is the first Swami to speak on behalf of Indian spirituality, like as a whole, um, he came in 1893. And from 1893 to 1895, arguably towards the end of 1894, he had given a series of like public lectures. He was on tour, you know, like the Grateful Dead or something. He was on tour and giving lectures here and there. And by the end of this period, he was actually very tired and actually kind of like depressed. And it's interesting to see that such a great spiritual master like Swami Vivekananda can have hard times emotionally too, because he was kind of, you know, he felt used up, he felt depleted, and he felt like he wanted to give a higher grade, a higher dose of spirituality than what he was able to give to so large an audience, you know, he wanted to give the cream de la cream, the highest teaching. So at the end of 1894, he, you know, went to New York and gave a series of private lectures in New York, and he, he was also incredibly tired. Although the New York lectures were smaller, they were big still. Like the room would be packed, the room would overflow, there'd be people in the hallways, people in the stairs. So even then, it wasn't as focused as he would have wanted. So in many letters, he writes, I want a group of a small group so that we can have cool, calm, clear thought. I'm tired of sowing my ideas like on mass and casting my ideas into the wind or something like that. He wanted a focus group. So anyway, towards the end of 1894, or towards the beginning of 1895, a devotee had invited him to like take a break in their house in New Hampshire. Now in New Hampshire, um, apparently Swamiji went into Samadhi by the bank of a river. So he was sitting by the bank of a river meditating and a groundskeeper or a gardener rushes into the house and says, the Swami is dead. And they all walk outside to see Swami there in, in Samadhi. And yes, you know, they're pushing him, they're checking for his heartbeat and for all intents and purposes, he looks dead. <laughs> You know, as people in Samadhi tend to tend to do. So he looks dead. He's like dead there. Finally, he comes down for Sam from Samadhi. He explains what Nirvikalpa Samadhi is. And he explains that his mind had been in that state. Now, this is a very exalted state of mind to be in. And that's what Swamiji was experiencing. So anyway, then about seven or 10 days after that experience of Nirvikalpa Samadhi, he um, moves to the Thousand Islands Park and there starts to give a series of private lessons to a very small group of um 12 or so devotees. It was 12 at the most. And they weren't, they weren't all there at the same time. So this was a small group and it was just what Swamiji wanted, a focus group. It was a group of people who were devoted to the teachings of Vedanta, devoted to spirituality. Many of them became monastics. A lot of them took the vows of poverty and chastity. Not all of them, but many of them. And so this was Swamiji's like ideal teaching situation in nature, in the quiet outskirts, like nowhere near a city, it's all very quiet and peaceful. And he said, I feel like I'm back in India. You know, he said, this, this, this scene makes me feel like I'm back in India. Now notice 10 days or seven days ago, he had just gone into Nirvikalpa Samadhi. So what we're getting in the Thousand Island Park lectures is perhaps Swamiji's subtlest teachings, finest teachings, most directed teachings. It was, I think for Swamiji, his most fertile period, as many people write about. So I'm going to now relate to you something that he said to this small group in Thousand Island Park about Makali. So remember, this represents his finest teachings and his highest teachings. So let's hear what Swami Vivekananda himself, who himself had an experience of Kali, let's see what he has to say about Mother Kali. So that will be, I guess, our starting point in our discussion about Mother Kali. So imagine, you know, you're sitting there in the, in the house in natural settings with Swami Vivekananda, who is refreshed, energized, and in his best. Okay, you're getting the best. So here, here's what he's going to say to you. This is from, by the way, Inspired Talks. These lectures were kind of compiled by Miss Waldo, who was a relative of Ralph Waldo Emerson. And Miss Waldo compiled these lectures of Swami Vivekananda in a book called Inspired Talks. It also appears in the completed works. So let's see what he says, Swami Vivekananda. Mother is the first manifestation of power and is considered a higher ideal than father. The name of mother brings the idea of Shakti, divine energy and omnipotence. The baby believes its mother to be all powerful, able to do anything. The divine mother is the Kundalini sleeping in us. Kundalini sleeping in us. Without worshiping her, we can never know ourselves. Now remember, he doesn't mean this in a psychological way. He means metaphysically to know the self. Without worshiping her, we can never know ourselves. Obviously, know the self, Atman, which is self-realization. Without worshiping her, we can never know ourselves. All merciful, all powerful, omnipresent. These are the attributes of the divine mother. She is the sum total of the energy in the universe. Every manifestation of power in the universe is mother. Beautiful line. Every manifestation of power in this universe, in the universe, is mother. She is life. 
She is intelligence. She is love. Those of you who are familiar with the Chandi will see how much of this is almost a direct quotation from the Chandi. Um, she is in the universe, yet separate from it. Oh, mother, you abide as the eternal source of becoming. Remember? You abide as being inseparable and inexpressible and as the eternal source of all becoming. This is the Chandi. So when you, by the way, when you study Indian spiritual texts like the Upanishads, and if you look at the Isha Upanishad and you look at Swamiji's God in Everything lecture that he gave, um, you'll see that it's just a, almost a direct translation of the Isha Upanishad. It's almost like translating in real time. So many passages of Swami Vivekananda are just direct translations from the Ashtavakra Gita, etc. So when you read Swamiji, you're getting kind of the essentialization of what is 5,000 years of spiritual tradition. So she's saying, he's saying, or really she's saying, um, she is in the universe, yet separate from it. This is what today we call panentheism. Not pantheism, but panentheism. She is a person, capital P, and can be seen and known as Sri Ramakrishna saw and knew her. She is a person, capital P, who can be seen and known as Sri Ramakrishna saw and knew her. Now his disciples at the Thousand Islands Park were familiar with Sri Ramakrishna's spiritual life. And remember, he was talking to Makali. Like he would, you know, be sitting in Keshav's drawing room and suddenly he would look to one side and say, ah, mother, you've come dressed in your Varanasi silks. How beautiful you look. He would suddenly like go into conversation with her and say, what do you think about this person? You know, sometimes in front of them. So that's what he means here. Like as Sri Ramakrishna saw and knew her, we too can see and know her. Established in the idea of mother, we can do anything. She quickly answers prayers. Sharanagata dinarta paritrana parayani sarvasyarte hare devi. Right? She quickly answers prayers. Um, she can show herself to us in any form at any moment. The Divine Mother can have form, rupa, and it can have name, nama, or name without form, saguna, uh, sorry, nirguna, sa, uh, saguna nirakara. Right? And as we worship her in these various aspects, we can rise to pure, be pure being, having neither form nor name. So to unpack this, what he's saying is that it's the divine mother who appears as Shiva, as Durga, as Kali. She takes Nama Rupa, which as you know from a previous lecture is called Saguna Sakara, the God with form who appears as a specific image like Kali or Shiva, right? So she can have form, but she is also Saguna Nirakara, the formless white light the formless God, like the formless God of the Abrahamic faiths, who's still a person, can still be prayed to, but it's not a person in any particular form or aspect. It's just cosmic consciousness. So that is the second aspect. And by worshiping her in these various aspects as Saguna Sakara and as Saguna Nirakara, we can rise to pure being, Nirguna Nirakara, having neither form nor name. So this is Satchit Ananda. This is Brahman. A bit of mother, and I like this a lot, a bit of mother, a drop was Krishna. Another was Buddha. Another was Christ. Isn't that beautiful? So all the avatars, Krishna, Rama, Buddha, Christ, Ramakrishna, Chaitanya, all of these were a drop of mother, an expression of mother's power. The worship of even one spark of mother in our earthly mother leads to greatness. Right? Isn't that beautiful? The worship of even one spark of mother, capital M, in our earthly mother leads to greatness. Worship her if you want love and wisdom. Again, let's, let's Sanskritize what this English is saying. Worship her. Do puja to her. If you want what? Love and wisdom. Bhakti jnana. If you want bhakti, devotion. As Emily is asking, how do I get bhakti? How do I develop love for the divine? Well, if you want bhakti, you don't just have it. You have to do something for it. You have to worship Makali. How do you get jnana, knowledge? Well, you have to do puja to Makali. Both of those, bhakti jnana, come through the worship or the puja or the service of Makali. That's what Swamiji is saying. And by the way, those of you who came to the puja, I know I had some parts of it muted because I was in a rather spacey mood, forgive me. But um, for the parts that weren't muted, I'm sure you heard that mantra. It's called a sankalpa. It's a mantra that we do in the beginning of puja that states our intention for the puja. Like, why are we doing this puja? And the sankalpa we use today was Om Kring Vishnu Rom Tatsa Tom Parameshwara Parameshwari Prityartam Bhakti Gyana Vairagyam Siddhyartam Gurvadi Nama Devata Puja Purvakam Shrimat Kalika Karmaham Krishyami Puja ka Anyway, um, Bhakti Gyana Vairagyam Siddhyartam Siddhi means to attain, right? So Siddhyartam, Artha, for the purposes of attaining, Siddhyartha, for the purposes of attaining Bhakti, love, 
jnana, knowledge, and vairagya, renunciation, I am now performing this puja to Makali, having first worshipped the Guru and other such divinities, using the mantras Om Kring and Om Tatsa. That's the mantra that we do. And it's so cool to see Swamiji giving expression to it in like simple English. That's the beauty, you know, like when you study Swamiji or whatever, things that seem so simple have behind them such tradition and depth and, oh, I could go all day. Anyway, um, that's what Swamiji said about the mother. And I'd like to explore a little bit as to the implications of what Swamiji was saying in that lecture. And also another thing, you know, it's good to memorize things that inspire you, right? So as you read, as you move around the world and as you hear songs, if anything moves you, you should memorize it. In other words, you should make it yours. You should make it your own. So if there's a poem or a song, or if there's a passage in a book that is valuable to you, well, keep it. Keep it close at hand because you might need it. You know, when life gets difficult, sometimes you'll need it. When your spirituality is faltering, you should fall back upon all of these thoughts, these words, these poems, these songs that you've downloaded and stored. So think of it that way. Like it's a very powerful practice to download and store a, a database of spiritual things like mantras, like phrases that you can call upon when in times of trouble. Okay. So one thing that's been very special to me over the years, it's actually one of my favorite things that Swami Vivekananda ever said. It is also, again, from inspired talks. It's also from those lectures in Thousand Island Park. Um, and it's one of my favorites. And it's with some reverence that I share it with you. It's sort of like what he's saying in God, Seeing God in Everything lecture. It's almost like that. But it's, it's got tantric nuances. So I'd like to just share with you this passage. He says, let us be God. Let us be God. And, and earlier he had been saying something like, you know, the brute is content to be where he is. Tamas. The man, the, the human being is always trying to improve himself. Rajas. But God is doing neither. God is eternally blissful. Isn't that beautiful? He's saying the brute is tamasic. Brute is just happy to be where they are. The man is rajasic, full of activity to make the world and himself and themselves better. But, the, but God, God, which is all sattva, God does neither. God is eternally blissful. And then after saying that, he says, let us be God. Make your heart like an ocean. That's the next thing he says. Make your heart like an ocean. Amal will know exactly what we're talking about, right? Like make your heart like an ocean. Um, then he says, go beyond the trifles of this world. Be mad with joy, even at evil. <sighs> be mad with joy, even at evil. See the world as a picture and then enjoy its beauty, knowing that nothing can affect you or nothing affects you. See the world as a picture and then enjoy its beauty, knowing that nothing can affect you. Children sometimes find glass beads in a mud puddle or a mud pool, I think he said. Children sometimes find glass beads in a mud pool. That's the good of the world. In other words, it's pretty, it's beautiful, but it's no more than glass beads reflected in the water. Look at it all with calm complacency. See both good and evil as the same, as God's play, enjoy all. Isn't that beautiful? Enjoy all. See the world as a picture and enjoy its beauty. Enjoy all. See good and evil as the same as God's play. Be mad with joy, even, um, even at evil. Now in the Isha Upanishad, in that Upanishad in the second verse, it'll say, enjoy the world through renunciation. So sometimes we forget, right? The purpose of all of this is to really enjoy our life. Like that's the purpose of doing spirituality. It's to learn to enjoy the life that we have. And according to our scripture, to Upanishads, to Tantra, to Vedanta, Vairagya, dispassion, renunciation is actually the way to enjoy the world. You know, so it's through vairagya, through renunciation, through seeing this world as no more than glass beads in a pond that we can look with calm complacency. It's only then that we can actually enjoy life, actually enjoy this world. And I'm going to hopefully in the next few moments explain why that is the case. So let's pick up some philosophy right now. Let's explain how this is true why it is that the world is a picture. Why is the world no more than glass beads? And in understanding this, how can we go about applying it? So now we go into the second part of the lecture. The, my preamble is done. He says that in 50, 50 minutes into the lecture, he's like, my preamble is done, sorry. <laughs> but now let's get the first, the first part of the lecture, which is this, Sankhya. In Sankhya, 
there are 24 cosmic principles and they're the basic building blocks for this world. So you can think of it as a kind of periodic table. These 24 cosmic principles are called tatwas. Tatwas mean like reality. And tatwa, literally reality, there are 24 constituents of reality, both physical and subtle. Let's explore what they are very quickly. The first of these is, depends who you ask, but the first of these is ahankara. Ahankara is a sense of egoity, a sense of being here. Meaning, without ahankara, nothing else is possible. Without you, nothing else is possible. I know that sounds a little solipsistic. It isn't, but even if it did, let's just for a moment play with the idea. Could there be anything without you? In other words, have you ever really experienced anything outside of yourself? Even notions of an observer independent, independent universe, like even the idea that there is a brain producing consciousness or a brain in the vat or a simulation or whatever, any of these ideas, they're only available because they're available to you. Like you are the ground of all of your experiences and there wouldn't be any experiences without you, the experiencer. That seems pretty obvious. So you are the main principle of this universe, ahankara. That's the first arguably uh, principle. Some others will say, no, it's not really ahankara, it's buddhi, it's cosmic intelligence. But anyway, I'm just gonna talk about it in a microcosmic sense. So you, the individual, then the next thing is buddhi, intellect. The third thing is uh, manas, mind, and the four, or I guess you, the third thing is chitta, and the fourth thing is manas. So these four things, uh, ahankara, buddhi, chitta, manas, respectively mean ego, intellect, memory, and mind. So this is what we call the antakarana, the maker of the inside world. Your inner experience is made up by these four faculties of the mind. So I guess we could say if we were to break up the mind into four components, this is what they would be. Now, there are five organs of perception through which the world comes to you. The first of these is um, uh, hearing. So the world comes to you through the ears. You hear the world. Then you feel the world. Then you can see the world. Then you can taste the world. Then you can smell the world. These five things are called the Gyan Indriyas. And Janaka Ji, this is for uh, Nirvana Shatakam, right? Like this is what Shankara is referring to in his poem, Nirvana Shatakam, six stanzas on Nirvana, the Sankhyan model of cosmology. So these five things, hearing or the faculty whereby we hear, uh, feeling, touching, you know, um, seeing, tasting, smelling, these five are called the gyan indriyas. Gyana meaning knowledge, indriyas meaning, uh, indriyas translate themselves often to organs. You'll see in English translations, they'll be called organs. But when we say organ, we think like spleen and liver. And that's not really what they mean. It's more like tools or faculties. I like to translate them as apps, like apps on your phone. They just allow you to do something. So these apps, these five apps allow you to experience the world. They're the Gyan Indriyas. And then the other five apps are called the Karm Indriyas, which allow you to act on the world. So this would be like speech. That would be the highest, speech. I think that's interesting. The highest of the Karm Indriyas is speech. The highest is hearing for the Gyan Indriyas and the highest for the, spe for, for, for the Karm Indriyas is speaking. This, is all, this will all matter in a little bit. So hearing, speaking. Okay, then the next Karm Indriya is, is, is reproducing, which is interesting. Then the next one is evacuation. Uh, the, the next one is grabbing. And the final one is locomotion. So these are all the karma indriyas, the ways in which you act upon the world, as opposed to the gyan indriyas, who are all of the ways the world acts upon you. Now, what is the world? Five subtle elements exist. Often they're translated as scent, as taste, as, you know, because these are all internal private experiences. But I prefer to translate them as subtle space, subtle wind, subtle um, fire, subtle water, and subtle earth. Why do I say subtle? I've never said subtle so many times. Subtle, subtle, subtle. It's kind of weird sounding. It's almost like cuttlefish. Something very cute to the word subtle when said over and over. But subtle, um, because you're not gross and tangible. Yeah, right? Subtle. Subtle turtle. Subtle turtle. Anyway, um, it's not like tangible in the way the physical world is tangible. So this would be, I guess you could say, the constituents of inner experience. Like dreams are made up of these subtle elements. So in a dream, there's subtle space in which the dream occurs. There's subtle fire. Maybe you're sitting around a fire with the, I don't know, Babaji and Yogananda Giriji and all that. No, who knows? I, I saw a painting once of like Swami Yogananda Ji, Swami Yogananda Giri and um, Ananda Maima and like Babaji. And like, it's one of those self-realization fellowship paintings. And I was like, oh, that's so cool. I like that idea of everyone sitting around a fire in the Himalayas. I also saw a painting of like, 
all the 27 club musicians in a bar together, like hanging out. I was like, oh, they're very similar. <laughs> but anyway, like maybe you had a dream like that. And so the fire in the fire, fire in the center of the circle, that's subtle fire because it's being seen in a dream. So these are the five subtle elements and they create the subtle realms, not just the realms like dreams, but also realms like the Devi Loka, you know, the, the Gandharva Loka, like all these various realms that, you know, the soul can, can visit in, in psychedelic states sometimes, in meditative mystical states, or maybe even after death. So these are all subtle states and they're made up of the five subtle elements. Then there are the five gross elements, not gross as in ew, but gross as in uh, tangible, physical, actual. So there are, of course, the highest of them would be the principle of space, you know, then the next one would be the principle of um, space is the highest element because it contains all the other elements. Then after that would be wind, air, space moving, by the way, atmosphere moving is called value. I don't like to translate value as air because it's not literally air. Air can just mean atmosphere. It's wind. It's air moving. So value, tatua means wind. Then you have the next level of subtlety is fire, teja tatua. Then you have water, ap tatua. Finally, you have prithivi tatua, earth. So these five things, space, wind, fire, water, earth, they make up the five basic physical elements that are the grounds of all of this. So when you have a physical experience, it's because of these five elements. You have a subtle experience because of these five subtle elements. Now, even in physical life, we have subtle experiences. Like we go into a room and we feel like meditating there. And other times you go into a room and maybe a murder has happened there. So we feel like kind of eerie. So these are tanmatras. These are subtle elements that can even be felt in the waking state in the physical life as well. So the subtle and physical are interpenetrating one another. You know. Now this, notice, is the totality of your experience. All these 24 principles, the five physical elements, the five subtle elements, the five organs of action, the five organs of perception, the four constituents of the mind, ego, intellect, memory, uh, mind itself, all these things form your experience. So they are all objects to you, the experiencer. So let's take all 24 principles, the entire cosmological map that I just placed before you, and let's call all of it Prakriti. So we can all be given the name Prakriti. So Prakriti literally means the supreme creatrix. Uh, it's a feminine singular noun. Pra is a superlative in Sanskrit. So like Pra, Rabda, or Pra, the supreme, super, Pra. Um, Prasiddha. I know, I, I know someone whose name is Prasiddha, the great attainment. So Pra is a superlative. I think Stitta Pragna, supreme knowledge. I think, oh, bye, dear lyric. It was so good, good to have you here. I don't know where Lyric is, but it's like, it's like a Lord of the Rings set or something like that. It's so beautiful. She looks like an elf in like some elven forest. It's like dark where I am and it's so sunny over there. It's crazy. <laughs> I'm like, what? Ma, oh, I see. Like, Ma, your, your play is so mysterious. I thought Lyric was in San Diego, but you know what? If Ma wants, San Diego can be full of sun right now too. You know, <laughs> if she wants. <laughs> okay, beautiful. Enjoy Thailand, dear Lyric. Bye-bye. Kapkum ka. Okay, so now um, these, these 24 things, these are all cosmic principles and they're all called prakriti. Karta, karta means to create. So prakriti means the super creator. Kriti, from the root kri, action or like, by the way, the world is an effect. It's karya. Karya means it's an effect. So karya darshanam, therefore asti kri, uh, karta. So because there is a world, bye dear Justin, take care, Jaya Durga. So because there is a world, because the world is an effect, there must be a cause. So who's the cause of the world? Prakriti, nature itself, the creatrix, the procreatrix, Prakriti. Okay, now it's a feminine singular noun. This language, the language of the 24 tatwas, the language of Prakriti, it all comes from Sankhya. Sankhya is perhaps the most ancient school of Indian philosophy. Um, and in Sankhya, Prakriti is actually described as a blind woman. It's very interesting. It's a feminine singular noun. So of course it's a woman, but it's a blind woman. This is very important. Sankhya argues that Prakriti has no rhyme or reason. She's not a being. She is rather insentient mechanical creation. This is interesting because it sounds a lot like the modern scientific conception of the universe. I think Alan Watts says, we replace the clockmaker with the cosmic idiot. So now the, the, the dominant power in the universe is random chance. <laughs> It's an episode of New Girl where someone says to her, um, everything happens for a reason. And she's like, yeah. And he goes, and that reason is random chance. 
<laughs> so anyway, random chance is kind of the dominant power of this world, according to the scientist, according to the materialist. In other words, according to non-theist, there's no intelligence behind all of this. Natural selection and mutations happen randomly. So evolution is like a random process of selection. It's not ordered. It's not directed. There's no rhyme or reason. Things just happen in this world. The Big Bang just happened. There's nobody like causing it to happen. There's no will behind it. There's no intelligence behind it. So this is, I guess you could say, the non-theistic or the materialist reductionist point of view. Now, the Sankians had this point of view. It's so crazy, but their idea of this universe is totally what Richard Dawkins and Christopher Hitchens would be on board with. Like, it's this idea that this whole world is a blind woman. It just does things randomly. Now, this is pretty weird, though, because if you saw a child, like in a mall, wandering about on her own, you would immediately ask, where are her parents? Right? Isn't that like obvious? Like you would obviously say, because I'm seeing a child, there must be parents. Karya darshanam asti karta. Because an effect is cognized, therefore an agent or a cause must be existent, must be positive. This is a Sanskrit technical phrase. Karya darshanam asti karta. Because I'm seeing an effect, there must be a cause. In other words, if I saw, uh, 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 as, as Professor Staneshwar Timalsina gives a good example, if I saw like an ant hill or a termite hill, you know, if I saw the termite hill, I'll say, oh, there must be termites who made it. I automatically assume that. Like if I see an ant hill, I automatically assume ants made it. I don't ever think it just came out of nowhere. So that's the thing. The world is seen as not an effect when you just say it's a big bang, right? Like big bang is a starting point for the world, but it's not an effect because there doesn't need to be a cause before the big bang. That's kind of weird because in the world, West, for everything has effects. And I'm sorry, every effect in the world has causes. So the Buddhist realization is that everything is cause and effect. So then we say that before the first cause, there must have been another cause too, you know, like that. And there must have been an ultimate cause. But the Sankins didn't believe this. They're the most ancient school of Indian philosophy, a very sophisticated school. And they didn't believe in like intelligent design or cosmic will or any of, any of that. But however, they could not deny that this world was here and that it was dynamic and active and that like a lot of stuff was happening. So they called this world Prakriti, the creatrix. And by the way, she is so prolific, right? I mean, whether she's a blind woman or not, like this blind woman, even the Sankins have to admit, is so prolific. Like she, even right now in the last four sentences has created hundreds more plant species and insect species. Like insect species are proliferating at an alarming rate every day. And some of you who don't like insects, I know Bernal had a bit of an experience with the cockroach and stuff. Like, I'm sorry to creep you out. There are more of them. <laughs> you better get Nirvikalpa Samadhi quickly because they're coming. <laughs> You know, the best way to deal with a cockroach is nirvikalpa samadhi. You're like, ah, no, I'm kidding. You won't go into nirvikalpa samadhi if you're scared of a cockroach. But be careful. There's so many more insects. There's so many more like ocean critters. It was, she's, yeah, exactly. But now you're skipping ahead. Anyway, <laughs> you couldn't. Now the idea is like, oh, there's so much power and intelligence and um, will, but it's not like, it doesn't have a purpose. There's no teleology to it. This is very important. This idea that it doesn't have a purpose or a teleology is central to our doctrine of play, of mother's play. Welcome, Dudu. Happy Navaratri. So this, these 24 cosmic principles of Prakriti, gendered as a feminine singular noun, they are opposed, or rather I should say juxtaposed to a 25th principle. And that 25th principle is Purusha. Now, earlier I spoke of Ahankara almost in terms of Purusha because they're very close, but Purusha, spirit or witness is distinct from the Ahankara. And maybe in the Q&A, we can prove that. There's actually a little bit of an experiment that Greg Good, the American Vedantist designed to show that even the ego is an object of perception. Anyway, this Purusha itself is not an object. It's the supreme subject. So it cannot be seen. It cannot be known. It is the seer. It is the knower. What will later develop into the Brahman of the Advaitins, but not quite. This Purusha is what Shankara would call the Pramata, the cognizer or the knower. And each of us is an individual Purusha. So in this room, there are 46 Purushas, right? There are 46 Purushas. There is no God though. There are just 46 Purushas and all 46 of us are conjuring or experiencing or coming into contact with this Prakriti. So if you were to imagine this map, draw a line down in the middle and on one side is Purusha and on the other side is the 24 cosmic principles aforementioned. They're all of them objects, whereas the Purusha is the subject. It's what you are. Purusha means man. It's a male noun and it means literally dude fella so in sankhya we get the divine masculine and divine feminine and we explain this a little more in a little more detail in a previous lecture called god the mother but whenever we talk about makali we must start here with prakriti the reason we should start here is because 
Kapila, Kapila Muni, who is the founder of the Sankhya School of Thought, was one of the, I guess you could say, forefathers of Shaivism. He probably hung out with the Pashupatas, a very old group of Shaivas that were like thousands of years before the Yoga Sutra. So these Shaivas would speak of spirituality in two symbols, Shiva and Shakti, or Ma Parvati. Now, Shiva is the ultimate principle of transcendence. Shiva is God. And so Shiva, God in the sense that it's beyond this world. It's pure. It's ever, ever free. It's unchanging. It's pristine. It's perfect. In other words, it's everything this world is not. This world is transient. It's full of pain and suffering. Things come and things go. Uh, and it's debased. You know, like there's this idea that in religious life, at least, that God is good and the world is not. So we should do something to get out of the world and go to God. This, I guess you could say, is the basic kind of premise of all religions. The world is problematic. And so there's something better than the world, and that's God. That's typically what religions postulate. The world is a problem, right? Yeah, and Shiva is a no thing. Shiva is the transcendental, transcendental absolute, which is more the subject, the supreme subject, the cosmic intelligence. Now, in traditional religion, Shiva creates the world. You know, like a Vaishnava might say, Vishnu creates the world. Now, in Abrahamic traditions, the idea is that God creates the world and then kind of stands apart from it and then interjects into it from time to time. So... God shows up using one of his messengers, angels. God shows up in a vision to Enoch or something like that or whatever. But God is something other than the world, though it makes itself known in the world through figures like the Christ and, and et cetera. So through the judges like Samson or whatever. So you come into contact with God, you try to manifest God's power in the world, but God and the world are still separate, okay? Now, something very interesting starts to happen in Sankhya. There's this idea and it's kind of co uh, what colors Shaivism later on. Or maybe perhaps it was colored by Shaivism before, hard to say. No, Shiva, Shiva is the observer. Shiva is the transcendental subject. So according to, to Sankhya, Shiva would be likened to spirit, supreme spirit, uh, ever pure, ever free, and unbothered or unaffected by the modifications of Prakriti. Now, I know I was muted earlier for the puja, but there was a mantra we did to Sri Ramakrishna, which I opened with, and that was uh, Prakriti Vikriti Shunyam Nityam Ananda Murtim. Paramahansa, uh, Vimalam Paramahansam, Ramakrishnam, Pajamaha. Now, in that line, Prakriti Vikriti Shunyam, who we adore Sri Ramakrishna, who is eternal. See, eternal. Uh, nothing in this world seems to be. So we adore Sri Ramakrishna, who is eternal, who is the very image of bliss, Ananda Murtim, who, and this is so interesting, Prakriti Vikriti Shunyam, who is void of all the modifications and changes of Prakriti who is void of all the changes of nature. So God is something other than nature. It must be, because otherwise God would be changing. And what would be the like, value of that? Religious people always understand that the eternal is valuable. The eternal is true. The unchanging is worth having, not this thing that comes and goes. So the dynamic nature of God has not yet been articulated at this point. God is static. God is Purusha. And God is different from the world. And the world exists. According to Sankhya, it's a, it's a dualistic system. The world exists. It's just something other than God. And God experiences the world. Now, we have to ask this question. Why? Sankhyans don't really need to answer it. They just think that there's no, no need. And Prakriti is a blind woman. And by the way, they also have a big bang, which I think is really cool. Like they have this idea that in the beginning, the three gunas were perfectly e e equilibrated. Raja, Stama, Sattva. And then suddenly they just, something happened and they just like stopped being in equilibrium. And this world came into existence. What happened though? Now, you'll, you'll find in Sankhya a very interesting idea, and it's this. Purusha and Prakriti are all, always different. But when Purusha comes close to Prakriti, when there's a little proximity, by virtue of that proximity, then Prakriti becomes active. Before the proximity, Prakriti is called Avyukta, unmanifest. I'll put that in the chat, Avyukta. So there's nothing going on. It's not that she is not, okay? It's not, there's not, there's not nothing there, something, Prakriti, but it's something in potential. What maybe today you might call quantum flux. It's like a potential universe waiting to come into being, but it's not yet come into being. Why not? Because there's not yet a Purusha in proximity. So once Purusha or soul or individual comes close to Prakriti, then only Prakriti manifests into this world. It's so interesting. It's almost like only when you go to sleep does the dream appear. There's no dream without the dreamer's proximity. Or it's almost like quantum observer effect. I'm not saying it is. I'm just saying that I hear echoes in quantum observer effect of what like is being discussed in Sankhya as the proximity of Purusha and Prakriti. Okay, enough said for that. Uh, on that account, let's move on. Now, why though is Prakriti doing this? Why is she expressing herself in all of these ways? Now here you can plug in the metaphor of husband and wife, Shiva and Shakti. So Shiva and Shakti, metaphorically or mythologically speaking, or actually speaking, for those of you who've had mystic experience, are the 
ultimate husband and wife. They're deeply, deeply devout and in love with one another. And she likes to entertain him. So imagine he comes home one day and she does a little dance for him. I don't know. Like she just like wants to like please him. So she gets up and she says, does a little dance. Now she's so seductive, so powerful, the dancer that he's completely hypnotized and he forgets himself. I mean, that's kind of the point. I mean, entertainment wouldn't be entertainment if you didn't, for at least a few moments, forget yourself, right? That's like the wonderful release that you get from entertainment. Like you go and watch a movie and for a moment you forget you're sitting there eating popcorn. You're really, you're so invested in the movie that you really feel yourself to be in the movie. So the idea is that she does his little dance for him and he's so enthralled. He's so hypnotized that he forgets himself in the midst of that dance. So here's what's happened to us. We, the Purusha, Shiva, through the dance of Ma Parvati, through Shakti's dance, have taken ourselves to be the body and mind, which are part of Makali. So the body and mind are like on the screen, okay? Yeah, couple girls. Hello, Mara. Glad to have you. The body and mind are like characters on the screen. So it's like, think of Nish as like a character on the screen. A lot of children at the middle school where I, where I work call me Bruno. They think I look like Bruno from that one show. Because sometimes I'll wear like, um, what do you call it? The, the poncho. Yeah, I wear like a Mexican poncho sometimes to work. And then I, I apparently look like Bruno. So, so say Bruno is on the screen, okay? And there's like a Bruno body and Bruno face and like a Bruno person. And he's like on the screen. Now, if I go to watch Encanto, if I go to watch that show and I look at Bruno, I might become so fascinated with that character that for a moment, I forget that I am Nish and I start to become Bruno. Okay. Thank you. I'll t- <laughs> Mara gives me the Colombian Bruno pass. Yes, we don't. We don't. Thank you. <laughs> I, I haven't actually seen the movie. I know it's horrible. This is a horrible confession, but I should go watch it because I don't really know what Bruno is. I, 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 I Googled him. You know, a little girl was skipping on the rope and I walked outside. This is the first time it happened. She dropped the rope and she looked at me. She's like, you are Bruno. And then I was like, oh yeah, well, you're a little puppy. And she's like, no, I'm a human. So cute. <laughs> but then I Googled Bruno and he looked kind of evil. He was like, oh, and I was like, ouch. Okay, I guess. <laughs> I guess I'm like teaching defense against the dark arts in my Catholic high school. So I teach debate. It'd probably be the Catholic equivalent of defense against the dark arts. Now, anyway. Um, <laughs> so now, okay. Prakriti, she's doing this dance. It's like watching a movie and falling so in love with the characters in the movie that I actually think I am them. So if I actually think I'm Bruno, that's why I'm Nish. I'm not actually Nish. I just think I am because I'm so enthralled by what I see. You know, I'm so enthralled by, by the image on the screen. That's all. That's what happened. Now, what's yoga for? So simple. You know, yoga, tada, yoga, shitta, vritti, nirodha, tada, drashtu, swarupe, vasana. Yoga is the complete cessation of the mind stuff. In other words, the complete dissolving of Prakriti in personal microcosmic experience so that Purusha and Prakriti become separated from one another so that I know I'm Purusha. Now, once I know I'm Purusha, then I can enjoy Prakriti. But until I know I'm Purusha, if Purusha remains to me just a concept that I heard about in a lecture one time or read about in a book one time, then I haven't really known that I'm Purusha. I think I'm Purusha. I don't know I'm Purusha. I know I'm Nish. I think I'm Purusha. That's my predicament, right? I can, I can read a lot of books. I can attend lectures. I can hear about Purusha all I want. And I might end up thinking I'm Purusha, yet knowing I'm Nish. Do you know what I mean? I might identify more with Bruno than with the Nish who watches Bruno. And now, thanks to yoga, through samadhi, thanks to, 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 ending, to turning off the movie, then I suddenly come to. That's, the, that's a unique moment in samadhi when I come to and I'm like, oh, wait a minute, I was never Bruno. I'm not Bruno. I never was, never will be. I'm Nish. I'm, I'm using the mirror example. I'm in the movie example. I'm there. I'm like, and then I go, oh, now put the movie back on. You know, put it back on. Now I can enjoy it. Now I won't feel like I'm so invested. You see, the idea is not to end the movie indefinitely. The idea is to enjoy the movie by knowing that the movie doesn't affect me because I am the watcher of the movie, not the actor in the movie. But this arguably doesn't happen for us except in Samadhi. You must have Samadhi, arguably, in order to know that you're Purusha and think that you're Nish. That's the argument we get from Sankhya and from Yoga Sutra. Sankhya actually doesn't make that argument. Sankhya thinks that philosophically you're able to understand this um, on the basis of philosophy alone. You know, however, yoga says, 
That would be ideal, but to truly, truly understand it, let me give you a system. It's called yoga, Patanjali Yoga Shastra. Let me teach you samadhi, etc., etc. Anyway, that's for a different night. For now, though, I want to talk about prakriti in, in connection to mother. So prakriti, because it's a divine feminine, now we're talking in Shaiva terms of Ma Parvati playing the show. We have to ask, okay, well, what does she provide? And we can say she provides three things. Broadly speaking, she provides two things. The first thing she provides is called bhoga. Bhoga means enjoyment, literally. And I guess you could see it that way. She provides the joy of being a person. Like the world is full of joyful things like experiences. But bhoga has another connotation, which is to enjoy one's karma. Meaning if I do something bad, I would have to be the enjoyer of the karmic retribution that will come from it. So if I papa, meaning sin, if I, if I incur papa, I will have to suffer something. And that technically is still called bhoga. It's still called enjoying. Is, is, that, is that interesting? And if I do punya, if I do good stuff like Vedic sacrifices or whatever to the gods and ancestors and rishis and animals and what have you, if I do that, then I will enjoy punya. I'll get to enjoy something nice. But both are called enjoyment. So she deals out both punya and papam. In other words, she deals out both merit and demerit, both enjoyment and suffering. And that's both called enjoyment. So she gives bhoga. Now, all of this is central to my journey here as a human being. Reincarnation is accepted by all schools of South Asian spirituality. So of course, Sankhya and yoga will all say that I reincarnate life after life in order to learn. So I like to translate bhoga actually as um, learning or aparavidya or knowledge. Just like without falling in love and having my heart broken, I don't learn. You know, without burning my hand when I touch the stove, I don't learn. These experiences, getting my heart broken, burning my hand, I don't know, being involved in a genocide. I mean, we have to defend those things too. All of these things are both individual and cultural learning experiences. This is, this is crazy to say, but all of us are learning individually and as a culture by making mistakes, right? Like if a genocide happens and we've all of us been complicit in having caused that genocide, then that's something we learn from, right? If I uh, broke someone's heart, and I feel badly about that. I feel guilty about what I did and what I said. I learn from that. If I try to become happy through acquiring wealth, power, pleasure, and I don't actually become happy, even though I have all of those things to the nth degree, I learn from that. So it's because of her that I have these opportunities that I can learn from. She provides it. She says, oh, what do you want to paint? A genocide? Yeah, paint it. Do you like it? Okay, then don't next time. So I have infinite chances to learn. I keep reincarnating over and over and over within this world cycle in the hopes that one day I'm going to learn my lesson. What if I come to learn, actually? This is very important. I've come to learn that the purpose of life is God realization. Just download this. And the most important statement we can make in South Asian spirituality, the purpose of life is undeniably and irrevocably God realization. Nothing else. It's not to make money. Purpose of life is not to like have financial security. It's not to help the world. In a previous lecture, we explained Swamiji's, you can never help the world. You can only help yourself. It's not to do anything other than realize God. It just so happens that helping the world helps you realize God. So karma yoga can, can be put you, but your purpose is not to help the world. The world will help itself. Your purpose is to help the world to become better, to learn, to denigrate the self, to deny thyself, as the Christ would say, to learn self-abnegation in order for what? In order for this realization that you are Purusha at least to use a sunken phrase here. So if I don't learn from the world, I'm never going to come to the conclusion that the purpose of life is God realization. Okay, so that's what ultimately Prakriti will, if you don't know it yet, you will know it. Whether it's in this life or another life, I have great, great joy to be in a room with all of you because you know here we are and we all know it. Meaning we're not rushing. The reason we can take our time in these discussions is because we know, well, except for meditation, what else is there should we, we should be doing? other than studying this, discussing this, trying to understand this, trying to practice this. That's why I take my time in lecture because I know that I'm amongst people who understand the value of this. Now I'm teaching in some other places and sometimes there I'll be like, no, I've got 45 minutes, I keep 45 minutes because they're forced to be there, right? Like, but you're not forced to be here. That's the interesting thing. That you are here is a testament to your insight, whether you're aware of it or not, that this is actually the spiritual life is the most valuable thing about life. So that's ultimately Prakriti's gift to you. But unfortunately, she gives it to you through both like pain and pleasure. Pleasure because you realize it's not enough. Pain because you realize it's inevitable. So that's good, actually. It's good that she gives you that to help you come to the conclusion that the purpose of life is God realization. Now, if you can say with conviction that everything I do in my life has something to do with God realization, then you have learned Prakriti's lesson. Okay. If you haven't been able to say that yet, you still have some learning to do. In other words, you still have to go out into the world, suffer, and et cetera, et cetera. But once you know this, once you can say, 
I am going to live for God and God alone, whatever that might look like to me. Finally, she's gotten through to you. It might take some several lives, but here we are. Now, the next thing she gives, interestingly, is liberation. The next thing she gives is Appavarga, as it says in one verse in the Chandi. She is the bestower of both Boga and Appavarga. Appavarga is actually a Sankhyan term. It's a term that means a yogic and Sankhyan term, Sankhyan term. It's a term that means liberation from Bruno. Right, Appavarga happens when Nish realizes he's not Bruno. Uh, that's liberation. Now, you know, interestingly, in the Sankhyan and yogic worldview, there's nothing after this. Actually, this is it. Uh, you come, experience Prakriti for a while, then spend all your time in meditation, study, etc. And then you go into Samadhi and then peace out, bro. You're done. You're Audi 5000. In Samadhi, Nirvikalpa Samadhi, you merge into what you always were. Merging is not the right word here. You were never separate to begin with. You just turn off the movie and it's over. And you um, achieve the highest satisfaction. So this is like greater than heaven. It's like the ultimate bliss. You become God, you know? And that's one way of talking about Appavarga. One way of discussing enlightenment is the cessation of all mind activities, the cessation of the world. It's videha mukti, the liberation through the ending of the world experience. It's quite valuable actually. Because the world, if this sounds scary to you, it's only because you haven't yet had enough world experience to realize it's nothing but glass beads in a mud pool. Honestly, there's nothing going on here that's actually that interesting. Um, you've all, you've seen it, you've seen it all, you've done it all. Like, okay, I'm done. My play is done, mother, as Swami Vivekananda would say. If you have that attitude, then it's easy. You'll just go into Samadhi and you, you, you'll be finished, right? Yeah, that's the thing. So the idea is it, we don't even call it a Leela yet. We just say this Prakriti is not a Leela. It's just here to teach Purusha that he is Purusha. You're all male according to Sankhya. There's no women here. The only woman is Prakriti herself. She's the only mother. The rest of us are all Purusha. Whatever, like, by the way, your body is not your body. You can't say, oh, because I'm female bodied, I'm there for a woman. No, Sankhya will say, who, does, who owns your body? You? Last week, remember we had our 19 reasons you are not the body. And one of them was, how can you demarcate this part of matter from the rest of the matter energy field? That's like colonization. It's like going into the African continent and saying, this is Zimbabwe. And that is, you know, it's so artificial. Like the Sykes-Picot agreement, the European powers just arbitrarily cut off Africa without any regard to like tribal lines or anything like that. It's, that's exactly what we're doing when we say this body is my body. It belongs to mother. So you not you can't be a woman. You have to be Purusha, which is beyond woman and man. Both genders are mothers. Okay, but um, this Purusha is not playing. This Purusha is enjoying, and then this Purusha is free. This is Sankhya, okay? Don't mix it with other things. Like, it's very tempting sometimes to just, like, jumble up all Indian philosophy into this one big hodgepodge. Uh, but don't do that. Actually, try to keep each, each philosophy distinct. Do you know why? Swami Ashokananda says, um, if you're going to look at a mountain, it's actually good to shift your position every now and then. So look at the mountain from the side and then look at it from the front and then look at it from that side. Now, one side of the mountain might be bleak and no, no plants. The other side might be full of vegetation. You can't just see one side and say you've known the mountain. Similarly, you can't just understand one flower. Oh, Ad Advaita Vedanta, okay, it's true. No, 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 it's not true. Advaita Vedanta is not true. It's one way of looking at the truth, right? Sankhya is another way of looking at the truth. Tantric non-duality is another way of looking at the truth. Do not make the mistake that any one philosophy has a monopoly on truth. So it's good to learn many so that you can like shift your position and not only understand, but enjoy truth from different vantage points. So let's be very like technical and precise. In Sankhya, there's no language of Lila yet. There's no idea of like a Jivan Mukta, actually. It's all about coming into, not really coming into, but seeing Prakriti, experiencing Prakriti, and then leaving Prakriti through Samadhi. That's, that's it. Like, that's what's going on. So that's Appa Varga. Now we can go to a new philosophy. So that's enough for Sankhya, right? Now Sankhya seems to give um, like a material insentient reading of Prakriti. But that reading changes by the time we get to the uh, Bhagavad Gita. Now Bhagavad Gita probably way before Sankhya. And Upanishads, right? Like Bhagavad Gita is explaining the Upanishads. Now in the Upanishads, you get something else, something very interesting. And it's the idea that, oh, by the way, I should read you a passage. But it's the idea that actually Prakriti is not in sentient matter. It's not just a mass of blind women doing this and that. It actually has rhyme and reason. It has a purpose. And that purpose um, is maybe inscrutable, right? Like maybe we don't really understand why she's doing what she's doing or why she's doing it. But she is someone, Mahamayi, the great enchantress, the great illusioner. She's doing something. And so much so that in 
Bhagavad Gita, by the way, you can even have a Sankhyan reading of this, but in Bhagavad Gita, in Sankhya, uh, chapter, no, not Sankhya Yoga, in chapter um, 13, Krishna says to Arjuna, Prakritaiva cha karmani kriyanani sarvashaha. I like this line a lot because to me, it has a tantric mother worship reading because it means prakriti eva, prakritaiva cha karmani. Karmani means all the actions, kriyanani uh, sarvashaha. Prakritaiva karmani kriyanani sarvashaha. It is mother alone, or this is an overly tantric reading. It is Prakriti alone who does anything. He sees who sees that he is not the doer. Prakriti alone does everything. Once Swamiji was asked about his lecturing and he said, God speaks, God listens. In other words, it's mother alone through the body, mind, uh, through other bodies and minds. It's mother alone that's doing all of this. She's the doer. And, and now we ask, well, why is she doing it? So if you want to maintain the idea of the incomprehensible nature of Prakriti, if you want to jettison all man-made, and these ideas are very... Um, artificial, but these man-made artificial ideas of teleology, like why she did it. If you want to jettison all of that, and indeed we do, because those ideas in religion are kind of childish that God did this for that or this. If you want to maintain the inscrutability and the non-teleological nature of this world, you're left with, and, and at the same time, you want to maintain the agency and the doership of mother, you're left with this conclusion. Mother plays, you know? And I just saw in real time, the best demonstration of that. Angela has a cat toy. This is exactly it. She's just, there's no rhyme or reason to it. Cat likes to play, Angela plays with cat. Mother just plays. And that's the thing about play. There's no rhyme or reason. It's inscrutable. It's just fun for its own sake, you know? So in the, um, in the Vedas, there's a very interesting passage. I'll read it to you. Um... No, I can't find it. Okay, here, here we go. Here we go. This is a hymn from the Rig Veda. So Rig Veda is very old, right? And this is from the 10th book of the Rig Veda, um, 125, 3, 7. So the, the verse is this. I spread the heavens over the earth. I am the energy in Brahman. I am the mother of all. It is for me that Brahman resides in all intellects. And it is I who have penetrated all the worlds with my power and am holding them in their places. Again, apart from the heavens and apart from this earth, I remain always the all intelligent primal energy, as well as the one intelligent being, perfect and untouched by my magic creation. Isn't that so beautiful? This is from the Rig Veda. So don't think that Kali comes from the Tantra. She's there in the Rig Veda. In like the Devi Shukta, for instance, the, the, the Rishi, the female Rishi Vach, who is, Vak, who is completely identified with her cosmic aspect as Makali, is saying all these cool things like I blow through the world and I am the world and yet I'm something other than the world. So we get what is a working panentheism, which is this idea that Makali is transcendental and yet at the same time imminent. She is everything. She is all the 24 cosmic principles. However, she stands apart also. So the next idea we get from this Sankhya Kam Tantra kind of world is that Prakritaiva Cha Karmani Kriyanani Sarvasha. She's playing. She's doing all these things. And the third idea, now we come to Tantra. I'm just skipping Advaita, not talking about Maya Vada or anything. In Tantra, the idea is that like, who is doing it though? It's God. God is doing it. God is the world. God is transcendent to the world. And that God who creates, maintains, destroys, and is the world is none other than Brahman. So the same God who creates the world, maintains the world, destroys the world, is the world. And that same God is Brahman. That's so crazy. Like now you're getting this idea that Nirguna Brahman is Saguna Brahman and that Saguna Brahman is Saguna Sakara Brahman and that all of it is the world as, a, as, a, as, a, as the embodiment of that. So in Advaita, this world is an image, right? It's like a reflection or it's like an illusion. In Tantra, this world is a manifestation, the manifestation of Brahman. Like it's an artful depiction of Brahman. So that's why you get this idea of um, the clay is not clay. It's an image of spirit. The world presupposes spirit. It's, it's an expression of spirit. So in, in, in Sankhya, remember, Prakriti and Sank uh, Purusha are separate. This is what allows you to enjoy the world like Swamiji said. This Sankhya realization allows you to see the world as a picture and then enjoy its beauty. So the first thing to do is to see the world as a picture and then enjoy its beauty, knowing that it cannot affect you. 
You see what I mean? Aesthetic theory wise, you can't enjoy the movie unless you know it's a movie. Similarly, I can't see the world as a picture unless I know I'm Purusha. That's the way that Sankhya gives you that realization. Sankhya will show you that everything you see is a picture. Uh, Swami Ashokananda says, if you want to be happy, treat this world like window shopping. Just move around, like look at things. You'd be like, huh, cool. Just watch everything happen before you. Have no desire. Yeah, it's like a sentient video game, but not even that because video games mean agency. Like you're not doing anything actually. It feels like you are, but you aren't. Purusha doesn't do anything. If you still think you're doing things, it's because you're not yet living as Purusha. If you live as Purusha, your body and mind will be active. Like lectures will come, you know, build a chair, et cetera. But it's not a video game. You're watching. It, okay, actually you say it's like, it's like you're watching someone else play a video game, which I used to enjoy very much as a child. I used to just like sitting and watching other people play video games, probably because it was presupposing the Sankhyan experience, which is just to be able to just like almost voyeuristically look, look, but don't touch. <laughs> Remember, look but don't touch because you can't touch. You can't touch anything. Nothing is touchable to you. Oh, bye, dear cat. I hope you'll catch the second half of this because the Ramakrishna is coming and you'll, you'll enjoy it. Um, not the second half, sorry, not to scare you, but just the next 10 or so minutes. Now, um, this is a Sankhya realization. Look upon the world as a picture and then enjoy its beauty without knowing that it cannot affect you, right? That's one thing. Sankhya will give you that. Now, the next thing is see everything, good and evil, as God's play. They're all the same. It's all God's play. And you can do that only when you know it can't affect you. Okay. So now for Emily, Emily was asking a very beautiful question some time ago about bhakti. How do I get bhakti? You know, because it seems like bhakti doesn't come so naturally to many of us. You know, Let's say you're in love with a person and you are having a really bad day, like something is really stressful to you. You're worried about a final assignment or something. Can you be as loving as you could have been to that person if you weren't stressed out? Like, can you even say that you love that person at that time? Like you do love them. It's just that love is not being felt by you in the time of your distress. Do you know that experience? You're not able to like actively like express love when you're upset. That's why a lot of people are mad at their parents because your parents were so self-obsessed with their own problems. They weren't able to give attention and care because to be able to care for someone requires that you are calm and cool and chill. You have to be chill. If you're not chill, you can't love. The reason bhakti is so difficult for so many of us is because we can't love. The reason we can't love is because we're all so stressed. How can we love God when we're always negotiating with the world to like, gain advantage and we're always trying to avoid pain and, and suffering like we cannot really love god arguably unless we have this sunken re revelation that nothing can happen to me right like if i can look at the world as a picture knowing that it's a picture only then can i see it as beautiful my ability to find beauty in the world is contingent upon my ability to defang the world from its ability to harm me you see this is how Gyana gives you bhakti this is my Ramanuja for you today. Uh, bhakti is higher than jnana. Why? Because you need this Sankhya and jnana, this Sankhya uh, real realization to be able to see the world as beautiful, even in its dark elements. Because art can be appreciated even when it's dark. Like you can still enjoy the Red Wedding in Game of Thrones. All of that is still available to you. Like art is enjoyable because there are light and dark, because there's like blue notes and brown notes and notes that are outside the scale. Like you gotta have minor chords. Like that makes art beautiful. Similarly, even the dark stuff in this world is awesome. He who misery loves, to him the mother comes. Crazy statement. But who, who loves misery? The one who is not made miserable by it. Okay, just take that. The, the only person who can love misery and death is the undying one who is not made miserable by misery. So you have to know yourself as undying spirit. You have to know that nothing can really harm you. You have to know that you aren't being crucified. The body and mind are. Then only, and only then can you enjoy it. Only then can you enjoy your life when you're the undying, unmiserable one. Then misery is wonderful. Like darkness, evil is wonderful. We often say, look, the darkness of the world is not an enemy to be opposed. I've been saying this over and over. It is a goddess to be worshipped. But you can't worship her unless you know that you can't be harmed. Just the other day, like whatever might be happening in the world, the bhakta, the, the devotee of Kali will say, that's just Ma. It's Ma playing. She's enjoying it. Now, you might get the impression from this that I ought not do anything. Or worse, you might get the impression that you should increase suffering in the world. Obviously, you should not. <laughs> you know, It's Ma's play, not yours. So don't worry. 
you are increasing suffering in the world. Whether you think you're a good person or not, every time you talk, you're killing microbes in the air. You're consuming, like your very existence consumes. Like, don't worry, you're doing plenty of evil without even trying to do evil. You're hurting people without even knowing you're hurting them. In the name of your good works, you are harming innumerable societies. Don't worry, you're plenty evil. <laughs> in many people's story, you're like the villain, right? Don't worry, you're plenty evil. Even though you think you're good, so we're all villains in someone's stories. Don't worry. We're all villains in someone's stories. No, you won't find it. You'll never find it. I, well, maybe. Mothers. We're all villains in someone's story, but we're also heroes in other people's story. And the reason that's true is because no karma is entirely good. No karma is entirely bad. Like no action can be either wholly good or wholly bad. It's always a mixture of both. That's kind of mother's law. You know, mother's law is that there's always going to be both. So to be able to enjoy both is to do the best, knowing that you can't help the world. You're not actually doing any good. You're not actually even doing any evil. If you can't do good, you can't do evil either. You can just do what it is that you think is right to do at that time and hope that mother takes care of the rights. She will. Okay, so that's why a, a, a shakta can look upon the world as art and say there's nothing to fear here. It's all to be loved. So the benefit of having this image be so terrifying is because it's accurate. It represents the reality of this imminent world. Why mince words? Why make this world look better than it is? It's terrifying. It's horrifying. You know, she has a necklace of like embryos and it's like blood coming down from her mouth. There's like, you know, she, what is it? She slays without repenting. She rejoices and slays without repenting. And she makes the blood on which demons fatten. There's a beautiful poem from Sister Nivedita that I put in the Discord this morning. And that idea that she's like, she's killing all these demons and destroying the world. She's like fierce. She's Mahasuri. She's the great demoness as well. So sometimes when the Abrahamic traditions like feel scared of Makali, they're like, oh my God, you're worshiping the devil. We're like, yes, yes. And so much more. You don't even understand to the extent to which we're worshiping the devil because we are deifying the devil. Makali is, she's the one that destroys. She's the one that creates evil. It's all her play. But she also has a dakshina form. She's the one that loves. She gives boons. She assures fearlessness. Who is the one that ultimately gets her punishment, her sword? You. You know, if you don't understand her, if you don't know how to interact with her, you'll get hurt. But if you understand her, if you love her, if you propitiate her, then you get the. So the benefit of seeing God as a woman is it meets our intuitions very naturally of what this universe is, mother nature. And not only that, in seeing her as a terrifying drunken woman, it accurately de depicts the drunken terror of this world, which ought to be deified, ought to be worshipped, not uh, uh, made an enemy of. Okay, so now I'm going to close by reading to you something of uh, Sri Ramakrishna and his words on Ma Kali worship. And they're going to feature a few poems from Ram Prasad. So now we're going to look at Sri Ramakrishna and Ram Prasad. Okay. So remember, this world is full of pain, right? Now, to get God, to become realized, to get bhakti through jnana is very difficult. To get bhakti at all is very difficult. So look at what it says here. And we have a lot of doubts, right? We have a lot of doubts. Like even if I say you are the self, you're like, really? So doubt, Shang Saya, is one of the biggest obstacles in spiritual life. Let's see what Ramakrishna says here. It is through God's grace that you understand that. He means something that M just said. The doubts of the mind will not disappear without his grace. Doubts do not disappear without self-realization. Interesting. You will always doubt until you have self-realization, which could mean samadhi. Um, but now notice he's saying his, his grace. God here is a man, okay? His grace. Then he goes on to say, but one need not fear anything if one has received the grace of God. It is rather easy for a child to stumble if he holds his father's hand, but there can be no such fear if the father holds the child's hand. A man does not have to suffer anymore if God, in his grace, removes his doubts and reveals himself to him. Beautiful. Um, but this grace, note, descends upon him only after he has prayed to God with intense yearning of heart and practiced spiritual discipline. Basically, when Sri Ramakrishna means, when he says intense yearning for God, praying to God with a longing heart, he means mumuk shutvam, which in Sanskrit means desire for liberation, which can only happen after you've played your play and had enough. You know, you only want God after having wanted everything else and realized it hasn't fulfilled you, arguably. So he's saying, unless you have that mumukshutvam, you're not going to receive the grace. Mother, the mother, now notice this, the mother feels compassion for her child when she sees him running about breathlessly. She has been hiding herself. Now she appears before the child. 
And then M asks, so sweetly, but why should God make us run about? Why, why, why all the suffering? Why all the trouble? And then he says, immediately, I like that. Immediately, Sri Ramakrishna said, without having to think about it, he knows this to be true. Immediately, Sri Ramakrishna said, it is his will that we should run about a little. Then it is great fun. God has created the world in play, as it were. This is called Mahamaya, the great illusion. Therefore, this is so important. Therefore, one must take refuge in the divine mother the cosmic power itself. It is she who has bound us with shackles of illusion. The realization of God is possible only when those shackles are severed. The master continued, one must propitiate the divine mother, the primal energy in order to obtain God's grace. Hmm. So only through God's grace do our doubts get removed, right? It's God's grace and God's grace alone. But doesn't that mean that you can't do anything about this? You just have to wait for God's grace? No, there's something you can do. Sri Ramakrishna is saying what you can do to get God's grace. Very interesting. This idea that there's some actionable step that you can take that will guarantee God's grace, which seems to be a thing of chance. So he's saying here, one must propitiate the divine mother, the primal energy in order to obtain God's grace. Shaiva Sadanta idea, idea. God himself is Mahamaya. God himself is Mahamaya who deludes the world with her illusion. Wow. God himself deludes the world with her illusion. How easily he's moving between Shiva and Shakti because they're one and the same. God himself is Mahamaya who deludes the world with her illusion and conjures up, conjures up the magic of creation, preservation, and destruction. Almost word for word what the Vijnana Bhairava Tantra is saying. This world is a magic trick conjured up by the magician. Conjures up, and by the way, Advaitins rejoice, your, Mahava, your, your Shunyavada, your... Mayavada is maintained here. This world is not actual, it's not actual creation. It's a trick. It's a magic trick. Conjures up the cre uh, uh, creation, preservation, and destruction. She has spread this veil of ignorance, Avarana Shakti, before our eyes. We can go into the inner chamber, meaning deep meditation, only when she lets us pass through the door. Living outside, we see only outer objects, but not the eternal being, existence, knowledge, bliss, absolute. Remember the difference between Prakriti and Purusha? We only see Prakriti. We don't see Purusha. But by her grace, we can see eternal being. Therefore, it is stated in the Purana that deities like Brahma praised Mahamaya for the destructions of the destruction of the demons, Madhu and Kaitaba. Shakti alone is the root of the universe. That primal energy has two aspects, Vidya and Avidya. Avidya deludes. Avidya conjures up lust and greed which casts the spell. Interesting. That's how she keeps you in the world, right? Lust and greed. Vidya is, begets devotion, kindness, wisdom, and love, which leads one to God. This avidya must be propitiated, right? It must be worshipped. This avidya must be propitiated. Um, and that is the purpose of the rites of Shakti worship. So all this puja, like tantras, the purpose of it is to propitiate the darkness. The devotee assumes various attitudes towards Shakti in order to propitiate her. The attitude of a handmaid, a hero, or a child. A hero's attitude is to please her even as a man pleases a woman through intercourse. Right? So the hero sees himself as like the, the boyfriend of Kali, if you will. The worship of Shakti is extremely difficult. It is no joke. I passed two years as the handmaid, handmaid and companion of the Divine Mother, but my natural attitude has always been that of a child towards its mother. I, regret, I re regard the breasts of any women as those of my own mother. Women are all of them the veritable images of Shakti. You know, so it says that in the Chandi, all women are your aspects. And I like this one. This is kind of funny. The, the men in here might be spooked out by this next line. In Northwest India, the bride holds a knife in her hand at the time of marriage. In Bengal, a nut cutter. The meaning is that the bridegroom, with the help of the bride, who is the embodiment of the divine power, will sever the bondage of illusion. This is the heroic attitude. I never worship the divine mother that way. My attitude toward her is that of a child towards its mother. The bride is the very embodiment of Shakti. Haven't you noticed at the marriage ceremony how the groom sits behind like an idiot? But the bride, she is so bold. Isn't that, the groom just sits like an idiot. He just sits passively, but the bride is moving. This Shiva Shakti is Purusha Prakriti. Okay, now let's look at some Ram Prasad. 
Okay, what is needed? Hold on. Okay, he starts, and by the way, the, the scene for this next conversation happens a little before the conversation I just shared with you. This scene is Sri Ramakrishna is talking to Vidya Sagar, who is, by the way, one of the most intellectually gifted men of his time. So he's a scholar, okay? And you should understand that when Sri Ramakrishna is talking to scholars, intellectually oriented people, he's very bhakti heavy. When he's talking to like overly sentimental bhaktas, he's rather more jnana oriented. He always teaches to the audience. So he's talking to a jnani type, okay? He says, God cannot be realized through mere scholarly reasoning. Right. And then he says, intoxicated with divine love, the master sang. This is the Ram Prasad song. Who is there that can understand what Mother Kali is? This is Ram Prasad. Even the, the six darshanas, the six schools of philosophy are powerless to reveal her. It is she, the scripture said, that is the inner self of the yogi who in self discovers all his joy. She, that of her own sweet will, inhabits every living thing. The macrocosm and microcosm, meaning the purusha and prakriti, both of them rest in the mother's womb, nirguna brahman, the darkness of nirguna brahman. Now do you see how vast it is? It, in the muladhara, the yogi meditates on her. And in the Sahasrara, who but Shiva has beheld her as she really is. Here I'd like to quote the Maha Nirvana Tantra. Shakti is black. Mahakali is black. Because just as black absorbs all colors, so too does the great void, Mahakali, dissolve, dissolve all name and form. Only Shiva is meditating on, on the void. Only Shiva is immersed in Nirguna Brahman. So unless you are in Nirguna Brahman, meaning Nirvikalpa Samadhi, you won't understand what she really is. You might get glimpses, but it's only in Nirvikalpa Samadhi, which is here meant by only Shiva has beheld her as, he really, as she really is. Okay? Only then will you see her as she really is. Within the lotus wilderness, she sports beside her mate, the swan, Shiva. When a man aspires to understand her, Ram Prasad must smile. To think of knowing her, he says, is quite as laughable as to imagine one can swim across the boundless sea. But while my mind has understood, alas, my heart has not. Though but a dwarf, it would still strive to make a captive of the moon. Though my mind has understood, alas, my heart has not. Though but a dwarf, it would still strive to make a captive of the moon. She cannot be realized by the means. Uh, he goes, did you notice the microcosm and macrocosm rest in the mother's womb? Now do you see how vast it is? Even the six darshanas are powerless to reveal. So Sri Ramakrishna, after he sings, he always does a little literary analysis of the poem. So now he's saying, she cannot be realized by means of mere scholarship. She's saying it again. One must have faith and love. Then he tells a story about how powerful faith is. And then he goes on to say, if a man has faith in God, then he need not be afraid, though he may have committed sin, nay, the vilest sin. Then Sri Ramakrishna sang a song glorifying the power of faith. If I can only pass away repeating Durga's name, how canst thou then, O blessed one, withhold from me deliverance, wretched though I may be? The master continued, faith and devotion, full stop, faith and devotion. One realizes God easily through devotion. He is grasped through the ecstasy of love. The master sang again, how you are trying, oh my mind, to know the nature of God. You are groping like a madman locked in a dark room. He is grasped through ecstatic love. How can you fathom him without it? Only through affirmation, never negation, can you know him. Neither through Veda, nor through Tantra, nor the six darshanas. It is in love's elixir only that he delights, oh mind. He dwells in the body's inmost depths in everlasting joy. And for that love, for that love, the mighty yogis practice yoga from age to age. Here I must stress, friends, that love is not naturally, it doesn't come naturally. Okay, love is one. You know, look at Lyric in the most beautiful place in earth and he's like reclining on a hammock. <laughs> love is one. For love, for bhakti, and this is to Emily's question, the yogi, the mighty yogi, practices yoga from age to age. Do you understand? The rishis were once upon a time knowers of Brahman because they were first yogis. Those rishis who knew Brahman became the gopis of Vrindavan. Do you understand? The gopis of Vrindavan were the rishis of past incarnations. Don't think that bhakti comes so easily. It's not. 
Nobody has bhakti. If you say you have bhakti, I call your bluff. Who amongst us can love like a true lover of God? You must know God to love God. So how do you get bhakti? Meditate, 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 meditate. As is a man's meditation, so is his feeling of love. Sorry, I'm skipping him. Um, okay, let's go on. Okay, it is in love's elixir only that he delights, oh my mind. And for that love, the mighty yogi practice. Okay, when, when love awakens, when love awakens, the Lord, like a magnet, draws to him the soul. This is Kundalini Shakti going up to the crown. Like one, once the heart opens, that will happen. Um, he, it says, he it is, says Ram Prasad, that I approach as mother. But must I give away the secret here in the marketplace? From the hints I have given, oh my mind, guess what that being is. So now Sri Ramakrishna goes into Samadhi. Palms folded, facing west, he goes into Samadhi. When he comes down from Samadhi, he regains partial consciousness. He says, with a big smile, the means of realizing God are ecstasy of love and devotion. That is, one must love God. He who is Brahman is addressed as the mother. So Ram Prasad asks the mind only to guess the nature of God. He wishes it to understand that what is called Brahman in the Vedas is addressed by him as the mother. He who is attributeless also has attributes. He who is Brahman is also Shakti. When thought of as inactive, he is called Brahman. When thought of as the creator, preserver, and destroyer, he is called the primordial energy, the Adhara Shakti, uh, Kali, Adi Shakti, Adya Shakti. Brahman and Shakti are identical like fire and its power to burn. Those of you from the Thursday night discussion, right? Literally quoting from the Vignana. He never read the Vignana Bhairava, but this is like a literal line from it. It's identical, like fire and its power to burn. When we talk of fire, we automatically mean also its power to burn. Again, the fire's power to burn implies the fire itself. If you accept one, you must accept the other. Brahman alone is addressed as mother. This is because a mother is an object of great love. So now we come to it. The reason it's better to refer to Brahman or God, the Lord, the Lord Father as mother, is because the love for the mother comes more naturally to us than love for the father. It's easier to surrender to the mother than it is to surrender to like a male principle. A male principle, father sometimes drops the baby, right? But mother will never. So approaching mother, God as mother, uh, shaktifying God, seeing God as a woman, is more powerful in terms of it's more natural. That's what he's saying here. Uh, one is able to realize God just through love, ecstasy of feeling, devotion, love, and faith. These are the means. So almost directly to the question of how to get bhakti, he sings another song. He says, listen to a song. As is a man's meditation, so is his feeling of love. That's how can we say it better than that? The more deeply you go into meditation, the more deeply you can love. As is a man's meditation, so is his feeling of love. As is a man's feeling of love, so is his gain. And faith is the root of all. If in the nectar lake of Mother Kali's feet, my mind remains immersed, of little use are worship, oblations, and sacrifice. What is needed is absorption in God, loving him intensely. The nectar lake is the lake of immortality. And then he goes on to say about how all karma leads to this. Karma yoga leads to this love. You know, so it's through karma yoga that you become pure enough. It's through raja yoga that you become pure enough. And in that purity, love awakens. For this love, the mighty yogi practices from age to age. So don't play. Devotion doesn't come to us. If you think, oh, I'm uniquely unable to be devotional. It's not just you. Those who are in the Hare Krishna temples crying and jumping around, pretenses most of the time. Be careful. Devotion is not an easily won thing. And Sri Ramakrishna is saying, if you would want devotion, if you would aspire to devotion, it's better to see God as a mother. It's better to do daily worship to God, uh, puja to Makali or whatever other ritualistic worship you do, propitiate, serve. And most of all, take Makali's name, meaning say the name over and over and keep saying mother, 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 ma, ma, ma. So I'll leave you now with this poem from Ram Prasad again. <laughs> <laughs> right. This is the Ram Prasad poem that I really like. I liked it so much that I put it in a little card. So in my, in my Gospel of Sri Ramakrishna, this card sometimes falls out. And it's a poem that really is so meaningful to me. And it's meaningful because it's when it's to be remembered when spirituality is like going to the dogs. You know, it's like when things are really hard, when you don't feel like meditating, when you don't feel like praying, when you're full of doubt and you're just feeling guilty and just 
just being hard on yourself. It's when life is a mess and everything around you is falling to pieces. That's when this sentiment is sung. So Ram Prasad says, mother, mother, how natural. Mother, mother, my boat is sinking here in the ocean of this world. Fiercely, the hurricane of delusion rages on every side. Clumsy is my helmsman, the mind. Stubborn, my six oarsmen, the passions. Into a pitiless wind, I sailed my boat, and now it is sinking. Split is the rudder of devotion. Tattered is the sail of faith. Into my boat, the waters are pouring. Tell me, what shall I do? For with my failing eyes, alas, nothing but darkness do I see? And this is the most important sentiment. Here in the waves I will swim, O mother. Here in the waves I will swim, O mother. And cling to the raft of thy name.